Hello, before we get started, while everybody's filtering in, I have a nice book to give away. The Waifu, The Secrets of Wireless Hacking. I'm going to do a contest for giving away the, this. For those of you that have uh, internet access, the first person that can call out the last RFC number to be released, get a copy of the book. The last RFC number. No, they're all wrong. Keep going. The last RFC number. RFCEditor.org has a search by ID. Nope. It's in the 4,000 range. Rack on the ground with the Army. The main part of the talk is going to be about IEDs or improvised explosive devices. We'll talk about composition, typo typology, and then some strategies to defeating them, and then a little bit about the future. Uh, first, operational security. How many here are uh, former military, active duty military? You've all heard of operational security. Operational security is, is the gray area. The reason being is you have publicly releasable information, and then you have classified information. And then you have information which is not classified, but it's generally called sensitive, or sensitive but unclassified information. This is where operational security comes into play. This is open source information that if you put enough of it together, may start revealing classified information. So that's really kind of the gray line, that, uh, or the challenge that I had in this brief. Because I'm exposed to classified materials, I have to be able to say, I have to be able to draw that line somewhere uh, and determine what's okay to talk to you guys about and what's not okay. And the challenge for me was, is it even worth trying to draw a line to give you guys this talk? So I went back and forth on that for a while, and I think it is, and that's why I'm here today. This, this, the challenge for me is for you to walk out of here after 15 minutes and say, wow, that was really cool. And at the same time, this presentation gets posted on the ShmooCon website or somewhere, and some insurgent in Iraq downloads it and wastes their time because there's nothing good in it for them. So that's the challenge for me, for you to walk out of here and say, that was really cool, but I don't want to give away any information, you know? Because I was with those guys over there. I don't want people getting hurt based on what I'm talking about. I'm not going to talk about it specifically in the brief. Please somebody remind me to talk about, a little bit about military blogs, because that's that for really into this OPSEC uh, category as well. OK, here's the necessary disclaimers. This presentation's unclassified. Uh, you're going to ask me a question, and when I say sorry, I can't talk about it. I'm sorry. Y you guys are hackers. You're going to come up with, with the good questions that I can't answer. I'll try to answer them as best as I can. Nothing in this presentation is classified. It's not for official use only. Uh, it doesn't contain information recording ongoing incidents. It's nothing protected by the Privacy Act. This is all stuff I have to say. Um, DOD directives. The first one is clearance of DOD information for public release. It basically says if the DOD releases it in a press release, I can talk about it. Isn't that great? Um, the second one is 5400.7 uh, is the DOD Info Freedom of Information Act. That means I can talk about it if the DOD is likely to release it to you as Freedom of Infor Information Act. The last one is standards of conduct. This has to do with me uh, not working on the presentation while I'm working on work computers and stuff like that. So I did it all at home. Here's the background. I'm active duty Navy lieutenant. I've got eight years, a little over eight years of experience. I'm a qualified EA6B Prowler Electronic Countermeasures Officer, so I do electronic warfare. That's my specialty. I'm a licensed amateur radio operator, um, N3WI. I'm one of the administrators of Church of Wi-Fi forums, and I'm, if you are a regular on DEF CON or NetStombler forums, you'll see me there. I'm, I'm on there quite a bit. Uh, also, if you go to YouTube, type in ShmooCon. The first one that comes up, ShmooCon War Driver, that's the video. I made that video based on some of my rag. This is what I used to do. That's EA6B Prowler, VAQ-139. I jam enemy radars and enemy, enemy communications. I did this in 2003 uh, in the beginning of Operation Iraqi Freedom. Uh, aircraft carrier, USS Abraham Lincoln. So this is all stuff I'm really used to. Uh, what else we got here? That's me sitting in the back of a Prowler. If you get in a military jet and there's something that's black and yellow, don't ever touch it. <laughs> OK? That's the ejection handle. That will, you know. Did you find this at the heart? No. And that's one of our jets going off the front end of an aircraft carrier. Zero to, zero to 135 miles an hour in about two seconds. It's really cool. Now, this is what I did in the last year. 
Okay, you, you've seen that photo of Saddam shooting off with, with a suit and the fedora, and he shoots off the shotgun. He's standing in front of the crowd. That's where, that's where I'm standing up here. This is in the parade grounds in uh, Baghdad. This is uh, a, a convoy that I was with. We got stopped on a possible IED. We were there for like three hours in, in about 130 degree heat. That was really fun. Fortunately, this was not me, but this is a video of uh, a screenshot from an IED going off. And then last, okay, I did go to the pool twice at the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad, so it's, it's actually very nice. Okay, why is the Navy in Iraq? You know, I was trained to fly airplanes, so what am I doing in Iraq? Well, the, th the first is the threat from improvised explosive devices. If you go to MNFI homepage, which is like the official Iraq, U.S. Army in Iraq page, it says the majority of insurgent attacks come from IEDs. Uh, it says that... Uh, most of our casualties are from IEDs. Most of our soldiers are getting killed. The numbers vary. 65 to 70 percent of our casualties come from IEDs. So that's the major threat. Uh, snipers, yes. Other stuff like that. Suicide bombers, yes. But it's mostly IEDs. So that's right off the that's a, off an official government homepage. That's what they're saying uh, about that. So second thing, the army asked for help. This is a letter from. Uh, 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 General Chiarelli, who was uh, one of the generals in charge in Iraq in the Army, to uh, this Chief of Naval Operations, uh, Admiral Mullen, and they basically said, hey, you guys got a lot of electronic warfare experience. We really don't have any. We could use your guys over here for help. So that's what they did. They, this happened about uh, a year and a half ago. The Army said, we really need your help until we can train our own guys to do this. Because this is something I already do. So they asked for help, and they sent us. So threat from improvised explosive devices, the Army asked for help, and the Navy's already got uh, people that do electronic warfare. We do this all the time. I'm trained to do this. My job's to jam stuff. And that equals JCCS1, and I'll talk about that in a second. JCCS1 is, stands for Joint Crew Composite Squadron 1, and what the heck does that mean? Of course, the Army loves or the military loves acronyms. Joint Crew Composite Squadron 1. Well, joint, you know, that means all the services. Crew itself is an acronym for Counter REC IED, which is an acronym in itself for Improvised Explosive Devices. <laughs> so you've got three embedded acronyms. Here's the, this is the mission statement from our home page. Suppress the RC IED threat, so radio-controlled Improvised Explosive Devices to Coalition Forces. So suppress, you know, suppress the RC IED, so prevent IEDs from going off. Uh, that's, that's the mission statement. Let's talk about IEDs. What makes up an IED? Well, there's three basic components. You may have more, but this is really the three basic components. First of all, you need an initiating device. An initiating device is anything that sends a signal to detonate the device. And uh, when we talk about RC or radio controlled, anything that transmits a signal from one place to another uh, the an, uh, an initiating device. So let's talk about that a little bit. Initiators. Well, let's talk about, there's, there's four basic kinds of initiators. Command wire. This is the wire going from the device to somebody with a plunger or a button. They're pressing the button that sends a signal down the wire. When we talk about radio control or jammers. We're not talk, we can't de really defeat that sort of thing. Uh, second, we're talking about victim-operated devices. This is like a mine or a pressure wire, something that the victim, the person who's intended to be uh, 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 caused or uh, you know caused by that device, to actually sets it off. Vehicle borne would be like a vehicle, uh, a suicide bomber in a vehicle, and then lastly would be um, radio controls, and that's that's kind of what I did in Iraq. Radio controlled, so something that sends a signal. Here's good examples of, of devices that send signals out. A key fob, one you got in your pocket. Um, Motorola talk about radios. Uh, Long-range cordless telephones, not really prevalent in the United States because of power restrictions by the FCC, but very common in Europe and the Middle East. Uh, just like the phone in your house, except that you can talk you know, 30, 40, 50 miles with it. And then a cell phone. And, and that's kind of where we'll, where, where we'll uh, talk about. Secondly, you need a detonator. Something to send, something, uh, the initiator receives a signal. Detonator is the, is the kind of sets off the explosive charge. Um, 
So what kind of detonators do we have? Well, dead cord. It's very common. If you're, if you're involved in the construction business, you've seen this thing. Uh, second picture up there is a, f or a bunch of fuses. Uh, on the bottom left-hand corner, you've got blasting caps and then some more dead cords. So these are devices that receive a signal from an initiator and actually set off the chain. The third device in an, that makes up an IED is an explosive charge. Any kind of explosive charge. Artillery shells, mortar shells, unexploded ordnance, anti-tank mines, homemade explosives. So anything. And you can imagine there might be a little bit of this laying around in Iraq. I'm going to talk about five steps to attacking the IED problem. We'll talk about the challenges associated with each. The first is eliminating the source materials. We just talked about the source materials. The initiating devices, the detonators, the explosive charges. Initiators are dual-use technology. Actually, they're really civilian-use technology. All the things we talked about, uh, key fobs, cell phones, you know, we can't, obviously we can't ban that stuff. We can't say, sorry, Iraq, you can't have cell phones. Um, so there are devices that are designed for non-military purposes that are being used for, you know, military purposes. So there's a plentiful supply. They're basically impossible to track. And it's actually required for basic government functions, and I'll talk about that in a second. On the next slide, hopefully. At the end, uh, 1991, first Gulf War, Iraqi landline network, what existed of it, was virtually destroyed. Uh, in 2003, beginning of Iraqi freedom, uh, the rest of the network was, any part of it that was rebuilt was destroyed. So it's basically non-existent. They estimate that maybe four to 600,000 people in Iraq have landline service, and that means it works sometimes, not all the time. So, and they estimated it would cost about $1 billion to rebuild, too expensive. A lot of cell phone companies, especially in Europe and the United States, said, hey, we can put cell towers up a lot cheaper than that. Uh, so in 2003, they started installing cell networks. GSM 900 networks is, was the network of choice. There's uh, five or six uh, Iraqi cell phone providers. The first two in bold, Arachna and AsiaCell, are the two primary ones. 2004, they had 1 1.1 million subscribers. 2006, they're up to 7.1 million subscribers. And this is a country that has like 20-some million people. So everybody's got a cell phone in Iraq. Well, not everybody, but almost everybody's got a cell phone in Iraq. So, and the government operates on cell phones. So you can't just stop cell phone use. You can't just create a jammer that jams all the cell phones. Because the government uses it. It's, you know, that, this is a coverage map of Arachna. Uh, it doesn't look like it covers a lot, but actually this covers a large section of the population. Covers Baghdad in the center of the country. Out towards the west, it covers the cities of uh, Fallujah and Ramadi. Uh, down uh, in the south corner, you have Basra. It also covers Karb. This covers a large segment of the population. Uh, and then the second largest provider is Asia Cell. You see, they cover a, a lar large portion of the central of the country, as well as up north in the Kurdish regions. And there's actually some Kurdish cell phone providers that actually cover even more than that. Our second uh, form of a, a source material is. Uh, well, when you're rebuild, rebuilding a country, construction all going on all over the country, explosives and detonators are, you know, again, it's a dual-use technology. There's legitimate reasons for people to have uh, debt cord, blasting caps, you know, in reconstruction efforts. So you've got legitimate uses for it. Uh, and, of course, now they're being exploited uh, for use uh, to set off IEDs. Plentiful supply, and again, another thing that impossible to track. I mean, this, it's not something you put serial numbers on and uh, track. There's some, they're starting to do some tracking of explosives with RFIDs, but it's just, it's just not there yet. Lastly is the explosive charges. Well, there's huge caches of, of uh, unused ordnance left over from the Iran-Iraq War, 1990 to 88, and from the first Gulf War. Artillery shells, mortar shells, unexploded ordnance. And we t all you ever heard uh, 2000 through 2003 was WMDs, WMDs, weapons of mass destruction, whether they're there or not. I'm not going to go in. This is not a political presentation about the war. I don't care if you're for or against it. Uh, but the focus was on weapons of mass destruction and also major conventional weapon systems. The problem with that is that these huge caches of ordnance were virtually ignored now. And, there's, and to a large part, they still being, are ignored. So you, again, you have plentiful supply and virtually impossible to track. So we talked about, really, the three major source materials uh, to problem and we can't really attack it at that stage because it's really difficult to, uh, to touch that. The second stage is 
Eliminating the IED network. And we talk about the IED network, we're talking about the guys who are getting the supplies, bringing them in, creating a bomb factory, the guys who are actually building the bombs, the guys who are financing uh, the bomb makers, that sort of thing. And, you know, I'm not, I can't go into a lot of detail. Um, according to uh, some press briefings, this is kind of our strategy for eliminating the IED network. Locate and, destroy, and eliminate the financers, the backers of the, uh, the guys who are actually purchasing this equipment. Okay, so that's, that's a reasonable approach. Uh, trying to look for the support structure. Uh, you can also see the uh, JATO is a joint IED defeat organization. They're kind of the central uh, repository for the, anti, or the counter IED fight. Their budget for offensive operations, which they won't say what offensive operations is, grows from 31% to, or 13% to 31%. And then the, the graph there is just, you see linear, in, almost linear increase in the number of tips that are being received, where people actually calling in and saying, hey, my neighbor's got a bomb factory in his house. <laughs> Trust me, some people will do that. I, some, I don't know the percentage, but some are legitimate. Uh, there's two primary means to eliminating the IED network. The first is called CEXC. This is pronounced sexy. <laughs> really is, trust me. It stands for Combined Explosives Exploitation Cell. And you know how acronyms, like, you read the acronym, what the heck does that mean? Well, I tried to translate it for you. Coalition IED Forensic Investigation and Hardware Hacking Group. So they take IEDs and play around with them and try to figure out how they work. Okay? They, they really are, there's like the unofficial name is CSI Baghdad. That's really what they call them. Here's an explanation of what SEXI does. Technical and operational analysis of improvised bombs develop measures to counter the bombing program. Uh, that's, I'm, I'm not going to say anything more than that. You guys can kind of guess what, what, they do, what else they do. So they're actually in country in Iraq. Uh, the stateside, the stateside uh, network is called TDAC. Um, Terrorist Explosive Device Analytical Center. This is kind of like ATF, DOD, FBI. They all kind of get together. It's kind of a database of where all the stuff gets sent after the sexy deals with it. Um, if you, you can Google this stuff. You're not going to find a whole lot on the internet about it. This, the stuff that I printed up here is what I found, and I print stuff that I found on government pages because they've released it as public information or something like that. But the key line there, to rent, uh, technically and forensically exploit uh, IED, so you know, hardware hacking again, the kind of stuff that you guys definitely would be interested in. Third step in attacking the IED problem is uh, eliminating bomb emplacers. When, do I, when I say bomb emplacer, what do I mean? Well, I'm talking about the guy who actually sets the bomb up on, this, on the side of the road. You hear in the news, roadside bomb, roadside bomb, roadside bomb, IED, same thing. Uh, a bomb emplacer and places the IED at the target location. He may or may not be part of the network. A lot of times they'll go out and say, here's $200, go put this bomb out there. And if the guy only makes, you know, 50 bucks a month, who's not going to take that? I mean, come on. He may or may not actually arm or initiate the device. They may just say, 50 bucks, go place this bomb out here. Go to pay somebody else. Hey, when the Humvee drives by, press the button, you know. Uh, they may be part of the network or they may not be part of the network. So. May or may not be involved in videotaping. Uh, go to Google, go to YouTube, go to Google, type in IED videos. You, um, I don't have any on here. You've seen them all. You've probably seen them. They're all over the internet. A lot of them are filmed by the insurgents. They love posting them on the web because they love seeing Americans die in Iraq. Um, so how do we eliminate bomb emplacers? Well, we already talked about one, tips. You know, you get a phone call, my neighbor's uh, laying out bombs. And some of these, some of these do pan out. Uh, the second would be community pressure. There is pressure in some communities uh, to rid out the, the bad elements, okay? Um, if you ask the average Iraqi, uh, do you want the U.S. military here? They'll probably say no. That doesn't mean they hate us. It means that it's their country and they'd rather do it themselves, but they realize they need help. Uh, so there is some, in some communities, you will find pressure to get al-Qaeda and the other insurgent groups out. And then money, you know, if they, if, if they're, if you can, they can pay them 50 bucks to lay out the bomb. We can pay them money to not lay out the bomb. So, got to use their, their uh, techniques as well, too. The fourth step in, in uh, attacking the IED problem, preventing detonation. This was my primary job in Iraq. Um, here's the, here's the uh, same quote that I gave you before. Suppressing the RCIED threat to coalition forces. What does this mean? Uh, this means we have jammers. They could be airborne, vehicle mounted, dismounted. Different models, different manufacturers, different frequencies, different capabilities, and that's all I'm going to say. 
I wish I could tell you more, but I really can't. That's the limit of, you know, we have jammers. I'm not going to tell you how effective they are, if they work or if they don't work. We have jammers. Okay, that's enough. And again, that's publicly uh, available information. You understand why I can't tell you this stuff? If I told you this jammer works really great, well, now somebody else can, can develop a counter to that. You know, and I'm not going to put my soldiers in Iraq in harm's way because of something that I say. So I'm trying to give you as much information as I can without. Uh, I want them to download this and waste their time trying to look for good information. Am I giving you stuff that's interesting, though? I, I hope so. I hope so. The last thing I want to talk about in the, uh, defeating the ID network is protecting against the explosion. You guys hear about this all the time. Uh, they, got, they don't have enough armor on the Humvees. There's not enough armor, not enough armor. We don't have enough armor. I'm here to tell you it's not just about more armor, okay? Um, the stand, standard armor, um, there's different types of armor. You have one type that's called high hard steel. Uh, you also have something called rolled homogeneous armor. These are different types of steel that react differently to explosives. Some steel is really good for stopping a bullet, but it doesn't do so well against an IED. So if your Humvee is designed with steel to stop a bullet, it's not necessarily going to do so well against an IED. This is small video here is, is a technique called spalling. This is a piece of steel being hit by a projectile. It actually fractures the steel and, and basically send steel out behind. So what you're, the explosion behind uh, the steel is not only from the projectile, but it's from the steel itself. Uh, and that's, that's called spalling. Spalling is very dangerous, and this is what causes a lot of casualties in Iraq. Um, so it's really not about just adding more armor. It's about a mix of white right types of armor uh, that you want to put on, on the vehicle. Also, more armor is more weight, and we have to understand the, uh, the, the problems of this. Uh, you add however many pounds of armor you're going to add, you're now, you've now decreased the maneuverability and the speed of that vehicle. Okay? You've increased the rollover potential because uh, you've probably changed the center of gravity of the vehicle. So that guy who's been driving it for six months and knows exactly where that rollover point is doesn't know where that rollover point is anymore. It now increases maintenance on your engines and your transmissions and your other uh, systems in the vehicles. Uh, we'll also talk about the shape of a vehicle, okay? An underbody is the most vulnerable portion of the vehicles, and you can't just put lots and lots and more armor. You'll see now the development of what uh, vehicles with V-shaped hulls that actually deflect the explosion away from the vehicle. This is where you'll see whatever replacement for the Humvee that will eventually come out will be something with a V-shaped hull, something along those lines. The other thing I wanted to talk about with the uh, um, Humvee. Consider limitations of a Humvee. 24 volt DC battery. Uh, this is kind of off the off the line, or uh, six, 60 amps. Um, and then if you mod it, you can get up higher than that. Um, but think about that. I mean, you can't just put like you know a thousand watt jammer in a Humvee. You just don't have the power to do it. You've got sirens. You've got lights. You've got spotlights. You've got all sorts of things that are being added to this vehicle. Uh, and you have to work within those limitations. So it's not just about putting more stuff on the Humvee. Trust me, there's a lot of stuff on the Humvee. This is a little bit of op uh, stuff that's on the, vet, uh, the future. The first is, uh, this is a completely civilian project being done at the University of Missouri Rolla. Uh, detection of IED using unintended, uh, unintentional radiated emissions. So you guys know that. It, some, it's, uh, you got a circuit, it's, trans, it's sending off emissions whether or not it's a transmitter or not, okay? Poor circuit design, it's sending off some emissions. These guys have developed sensors that can actually listen to those emissions. If you go, uh, I've got the link there so I, I, uh, I can show it to you uh, later. Uh, they've actually recorded the emissions and they can, they can say, oh, that's an RC truck, oh, that's a cell phone, oh, that's a, you know, something that may not even be transmitting at the time. Pretty cool application. Uh, there's some, a company that's working on uh, an explosive a resistant coating. So instead of adding more and more steel, kind of add a coating so it's less weight that you're adding onto the vehicle but still has some protection. Um, there's been talk about the development of a, a network called Local Eyes, which is using the cell phone infrastructure in Iraq to, it's kind of along the lines of taking the tips and making it automated so somebody can just call a cell, use their cell phone, you know, to put some code in. 
goes to some information and that code is eliminated from his cell phone so that guy has no, tr you know, somebody can't look at his phone and say, hey, you just called the tip line, you know. So it's just a sensor network of humans and cell phones. Uh, hyperspectral sensors. Hyperspectral sensors are talking about, you know, you fly over an area with this sensor one day, you fly over the area with the next day, and you compare the pictures, and these hyperspectral sensors can tell you, oh, hey, the ground there was dug up yesterday or today, before the picture today. So you can see where things have been disturbed, you know, so, but, you know, you're pouring over a lot of data for that. The last thing that we're looking for in the future is answers to the explosively formed projectile. I'll talk about this on the last slide. This is nothing new. The Israelis have been dealing with these things for decades. Uh, they're generally produced uh, in the Middle East. I won't say who, who makes them, um, but there's, there's one group that makes them, and they're really good at it, and they'll, they'll sell them to anybody who wants to buy them. Is that a governmental agency or a state, or is it a non-state entity? It's a non-state entity. Okay, how does an explosively formed projectile work? Well, explosively formed projectile is some sort of cylinder. You may see this about the size of a paint can. There's lots of different sizes to them. They're going to have a cap on that cylinder. It's going to be inverted or concave. This, it's going to be made of steel or copper or something like that. And the explosive inverts that, uh, that cap and basically turns it into a projectile, a molten projectile that'll basically eat through anything like molten, you know, like you know, just cut through, cut through stuff like butter. You can have inches of steel, this thing can go right through it. Um, so and this, this, it's, uh, it's, it's not, nothing, again, it's nothing new, um, but uh, it's, a, it's a directed charge and it's very, very difficult to stop. Uh, you're not gonna beat this thing by going further. I mean, this is, this, is the, this is very difficult to beat. I won't talk any more about that except Okay, I'm going to uh, do a few more things here, and then I, I purposely tried to go a little bit faster because I, I want to answer as many questions as you, as you can. Uh, first of all, acknowledgments. I want to thank the Schmoo Group for allowing me to speak. I know when I submitted this talk, they might have thought, well, it's kind of interesting. It's a little bit different, something that you probably expect to see at a hacker convention. But I think it's something interesting to you guys, and I hope it, I hope it was. Uh, secondly, Church of Wi-Fi, uh, a group of which I'm, um, I'm happy to be helping uh, advance a lot of stuff. And then my family, uh, my wife and kids, who are uh, definitely uh, supporting me in all this stuff. A uh, couple C also's. Uh, please see Renderman or myself. Renderman's up here in the front uh, for our hash tables. We've got uh, two sets of them, uh, seven gigs. We also have a 35 or almost 41 pre-computed hash tables for uh, WPA cracking. Um, and also see one of us. Uh, we're, uh, if you guys are familiar with the concept of the lockpick village, we're going to do something like that called a wireless village at DEF CON. So if you're, if you're going to go to DEF CON, you're interested in wireless, please see us about that. Uh, it's something that we're really interested in. Um, questions. I'd be happy to take your questions. Again, I'm, I'm sorry if I can't answer it, because you guys are going to come up with the really good questions, but I'll answer them as best as I can. Uh, so we've got about uh, you know, 15 or so minutes here to answer any of your questions. And it's kind of hard to see, so I'll try. In the back. Military blogs, thank you. Um, a lot of soldiers in Iraq, if you, if you read, how many guys read military blogs? Anybody? Military blogs. Generally considered the best information from inside Iraq. Uh, you, you'd be very surprised to know that most of the major news organizations do not have people embedded with the military in Iraq anymore. They use what's called strikers. There are guys in Iraq who take money for giving tips to the media organizations. So, and there's really, it's very difficult to verify this information, whether or not they're saying it's true or not. So you read the newspapers. I'm not going to critique the newspapers. It's, it's hard to tell what's accurate or not. So military blogs is probably the most accurate form of what you're going to find in Iraq. The DOD has a policy on blogs. And the general policy is that uh, you have to register your blog with your command. Uh, so you, have to, you, go, you go to your, whoever's in charge of your uh, IT stuff and say, a blog. And probably uh, and on a frequent basis, they're going to come to your blog and they're going to look at it. And they're going to read through it and make sure that everything's, you know, there's stuff, who, what's not appropriate. Well, who knows what that guy is trained in to say what's appropriate or not. So, uh, and then some commands will be more strict than that. You have to come to me every time you want to post something on your blog. Some commands are like that. You cannot post anything unless you come to me and get approval first. Some commands are like, you cannot have blogs, no blogs at all. I was fortunate enough to have very little 
oversight of my blog. I was able to publish things. My blog was talked about. I was never asked. Through, I was asked through another uh, uh, person to remove one post from my blog, which was you know minor, but uh, you know military blogs. Uh, if you go to millblogging.com, uh, it's kind of a source for military blogs. You'll find a whole bunch of blogs, several hundred of people that are in Iraq uh, doing all sorts of stuff. Other questions, please. Um, you you want to impact the local people as, as little as possible. If you can do something without them even knowing you did it, that's really the way to do it. Uh, the more that you impact their basic services, they're going to get. So that's. I hope that kind of gives you an answer, right here. Um, you mean like uh, internet and that sort of thing? Um, most people in Iraq have houses built out of rock and stone and dirt, and everybody's got a satellite dish. Uh, so a lot of internet comes through satellite. Um, I, I can't speak to numbers, but uh, I would say it's mostly satellite, wireless. Uh, I didn't do, I wanted to do some war driving in Iraq. I, actually, if you see my video, I did war driving in Iraq. But uh, um, it's kind of difficult to get, to put something outside of a Humvee and, you know, but um, yeah, I can't speak to that. A lot of it's wireless and satellite and that sort of thing. Save more people if people felt more secure about sending in tips. How, how anonymous do they feel like they really are when they send in tips? Um, it depends. Um, it depends on the community. Some communities are very infiltrated by insurgents, and they those people will not. You know, one week you talk to them, and the next week you come back, and they won't say a word, and so you can already tell what's going on. Um, these, they definitely fear the insurgents. So it's, a, it's just a matter of where you're at in the country. Are they, is the insurgents have a stronghold in that community, or are they just not there? So, and that, that goes back to the ethnic makeup or the religious makeup of the community, whether it's Sunni or Shia or Kurd, you know. I'm just wondering if you can uh, speak to the uh, complexity of a lot of these devices. Like, how, how what is the large, like, most of us here are thinking, you know, these are probably, like, really complex devices, you know, remote control. Like, well, is it mostly just really easy, you know, two wires and, you know, hit the button, or? Um, the percentage of the pretty simple, pretty simple stuff. Yeah. Not very advanced. Um, you probably don't need uh, you know technical degrees to do most of this stuff. Uh, I mean, and there's there's a wide range, but I would say I would say a lot of stuff is is on the, the lower end. Simple stuff. Explosive charge as simple as like a 152 or 155 artillery round, which is about this long and really heavy. Have we thought about instead of using air assets that are maybe only online for, you know, one hour a day or one hour a week, like putting some sort of external power source on a deuce and a half or even in a Humvee to run these jammers on, you know, whatever the highways or... I mean, it, to the on. extent that we can do that, we, we do. Okay. Oh, trying to outrun. Uh, yeah. um, okay. You got, uh, he, the question he asked was outrunning IEDs. Uh, you've got a, a an 18 or 19 year old army guy, just came out of high school. You know he doesn't know. I mean he he did, probably didn't take physics in high school, um, so he may believe that if he drives faster, he can outdrive an, an, an uh, explosion from. You guys know feet per second of explosives. You're not going to outrun it. Uh, so you know it's 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 a it's a matter of doing a little bit of math for them. Say okay, in the amount of time that this explosion went off till it hit your vehicle, you went you know three centimeters or something like that. So you're you're not going to outrun it. So, but uh, so that that's just taking basic math and, and giving it to guys that maybe maybe aren't thinking about that that sort of thing. Especially if they've done it before and survived, you know. So. Can you talk about how the Israelis have dealt with this problem? Um. They're basically doing what we're doing, but they're 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 ahead of us, very far ahead of us. Um, so they're very good at it, uh, as what as most of what the Israelis do, they're very good at. So, but they've been dealing what, what we call an IED or a roadside bomb. They've been dealing with for you know decades. So they're very good at what they do. We've I, 
I don't know for sure. I think we've taken some of the stuff that they do and applied it to what we do, but they're, they're further down the curve than we are. Yes. The British also face the same thing in Northern Ireland. So uh, we've taken from their experiences too, yes. On the floor. Um, a lot of the civilian or, mil or a lot of the organizations that are fill like uh, research are f associated with the military are, are doing a lot of advanced research on, on counter IEDs. Um, and you will find some of this civilian stuff. Most of the civilian stuff is hooked up with the research laboratories. This particular one that I mentioned from the University of Missouri, well, as far as I know, they're they have not had any connection with, with military research, but a lot of it, most of it is stuff that's being funded by the military or, you know, like I said, when uh, the, because most of the casualties are there, that's where all the money's going into, into counter ID. so. Yes? I just want to say in reference to uh, that, uh, several articles years ago referencing uh, uh, ballistic and explosive resistant polymers that more spray-ons and also advanced ceramics. Right. And that does decrease the weight ratio Right, and, and so I mean, we're looking at whatever can, we can do to make to make you know we 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 try to eliminate the IED source materials. We try to eliminate the guy putting the bomb out there in the network, and and if we can't do that, we're going to try to stop it from going off. And if we can't do that, we want to give that or those soldiers in the vehicle the best chance of living. Uh, we've got about uh, oh, seven or eight more minutes. Rapid fire, as many questions as you guys can ask. Anything else, please? In the back. I'm just wondering why we, when uh, Maliki's government is, is now in power now, why we're so ineffective at getting that documentation and, and finding out where the caches were to disclose. There's so many documents, and we have we don't have the resources to translate them all. Uh, I won't go into specifics. That there's. We just don't. There's so many millions of documents, and we don't have the, the, enough of the right people to say what those documents mean. It's real, it comes down to that. That's why you see the military really pushing hard for uh, language skills, uh, especially Middle East, the Farsi and, uh, and Arabic. The same thing that you would expect from any adversary. When we come out with something new, they find a way to counter it, and then we come out with something new, and they find a way to counter it. I, uh, just a, th that you would expect from any enemy. Uh, they're, they're very good at countering what we do. A lot of these guys uh, were, uh, a lot the guys that do have degrees, have their degrees in the United States. At MIT, at Harvard, at, uh, you know, we're educating, I mean, we have the best research universities in the world, so, uh, for by numbers, so, um, the guys who are educated probably are educated here. Um, these guys, aren't, they're not dumb. Um, you know, y you might have a picture of like this dumb Arab guy, they're not dumb. These guys are smart, they know what they're talking about. Um, you know, that's why we're still there, so. Um, how trustworthy are operators? I mean, if that's what their communication network is, is the MEO, there's all these foreign companies that actually operate those networks, how trustworthy? I can't speak, I, I honestly don't know. A lot of the American companies were pissed off because they wanted to go in and put, uh, you know, um, you know, CDMA, CDMA, and they, and then, but you know, we had restrictions on what was going to go into the country. We waited a little bit, and then boom, uh, you know, uh, uh, GSM 900 goes in there, uh, and they're really on the GSM 1800 as well too. You could do that. Talent in this room, um, many eyes on a problem. You know, you're, you're going to have more solutions. Uh, obviously, not giving away any major secrets. Is there any particular area that of research that civilians like the people in the room could be doing that might have useful applications? I actually made a, a, a unofficial proposal to get hackers involved in the IED problem because I know um, it's a clearance issue. That's what it comes down to. And they're going to say, well, it's going to take too long to get everybody the right clearances. And it's a matter of finding a way to get it non-clearance non required, right. but still you know, tap this vast pool of talent you right. got sitting here. 
the, the problem on the on uh, the problem in uh, on in the, in a front on the war front is you've got great technology. You don't want anybody to know about it, but you want to put it in the hands of an 18-year-old private with no security clearance, and you want him to use it and understand how it works. So, if it's if it's cleared so high that nobody can use it, it's no use. So, but we don't want to just you know, but we also need that 18-year-old private to know that um, if you are abandoning your vehicle, you may want to destroy that, or you you know. Have you guys? Is this interesting talk? I hope you guys. Thank you. We've got about we've got about five more minutes. Go ahead. What other types of detection screens <coughs> besides jamming? What I mean, is there any effort to detect? Mark one, mod one, eyeball. Best way to detect an IED. <laughs> it really is. It really is. The best way to detect an IED is to see it. Um, and I um, that just comes with experience. Um, driving the same roads every day and saying that wasn't yesterday. That piece of trash was not there yesterday. And it's, that's really what it comes down to. Uh, microwave technology is being used. The hyperspectral stuff is being used. Um, but really, the eyeball is the number one way to detect IEDs. It really is. Uh, when you detect something like that, do you guys always call in the bomb squad to take care of it? Are there Depends. Some shoot at and they blow up? No, don't shoot at IEDs. <laughs> <laughs> Some people, some 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 Iraqis will shoot at IEDs. Okay, that's just that's their that's their EOD is to blow, blow it up. You know, um, it depends on the mission. Um, uh, the mission that I was involved in was detainee operations, and uh, moving prisoners, escorting prisoners, doing all that kind of stuff. And oftentimes we couldn't stop. But if we saw an IED, even if it didn't go off or it did go off, we had to keep going. So it depends on the mission. Um, there are, there are guys who are out there just to look for IEDs. Every, they're going to stop for everything that looks like an IED. Uh, so it depends on the mission. Uh, everybody has the mission of finding IEDs, but whether or not you're going to actually stop. And, uh, and then when we stop on something that's an IED, obviously, I, you know, I'm not EOD trained. I'm not, I don't know how to detonate that thing. So EO, that's where you call an EOD, and they're going to come and probably use robots, because who cares if you blow up a robot, you know? Could the military establish a website where they could make public the information of how the insurgents are doing the IEDs and not so much what you're doing to counter them and then just accept submissions of I don't know. I mean, IEDs? I don't know. I, 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 that's kind of where I was trying to go yeah. with, with, you know, I can tell you, I, I can tell you how an IED is made because they make them. They, you know, that's not public and uh, that's not, you know, but I don't know. Um, it, there's, a, there's a line to be drawn. They've drawn it so far. At, they don't want people to know, you know, what the insurgents are. So. Let's say they present a problem, you know, fairly generic problem, and individuals can email in a information. That I would hope they there would be some way to do that. I mean, that's what I, when I talked about, I, I didn't, I never put it up an official thing. I just made suggestions. Hey, you know, the hacker community is would be the great would be great to attack this sort of problem, um, and you know. A lot of times, if you don't have PhD or a certification behind your name, not in this community, but a lot of times in a pr official communities, if you don't have PhD behind your name or you're not a physicist or a scientist, they're like, oh, whatever. Yeah, so. um, are any of these uh, sort of stand up detection mechanisms like uh, laser spectrography working with our? It is being researched, and there's research in that area. Question, what was the question? Uh, laser spectrography. Laser spectrography. I have not. In the back? Uh, there's either a wire or a radio transmission that's detonating a lot of these devices. How often can you detect uh, where that is coming from or capture someone nearby? Um, to DF it, you mean like the DF the device? Sure. Um, it's just a matter of, I don't think there's a lot of that going on. And I don't think it's, it's, it's just you're getting into how many tasks are you going to give an 18-year-old soldier to do? So, you know, DF is not his primary job. His primary job is to go out and kill people. So, well, he's a warfighter. I mean, you know. any in the back. How are the insurgents spreading information amongst themselves? Are 
website, There's internet. People sitting in a room like we are talking about the opposite. Internet. They have their they have their forums and their websites just like we do. Um, they make. Right. I mean, they do have. They they'll, they will meet, and when they do meet, we hopefully we can drop a bomb on their. You know. <laughs> but they use the internet more, probably more than we do. Well, not more than this group, but more than the general public. <laughs> Right. But again, can we, can we, it's a matter of what can we go after and, you know. Anything else? I can't see all the way in the back, so if there's, yes, right over here. How many IEDs during a normal day do you find and disable? Uh, can't say. A lot and a lot. Okay. Yeah, the question he asked was how many IDs do you find, how many disable, how many go off? A lot and a lot. I can't, I, I can't go into numbers. Uh, there's, there's a lot, I'll say that. Any other questions? Uh, thank you for letting me give this presentation. Um, I hope you feel like you've, you, I hope you feel like in the last 50 minutes you've heard something that, wow, that's really cool, but yeah, he didn't say anything that the enemy could use against our soldiers in Iraq. Uh, I don't care if you're for or against the war. That really doesn't matter. This is about, you know, my job was about keeping people alive. I don't have a choice to be there. Most those guys don't have a choice to be there, so. Um, whether or not you support the war or not, that really doesn't matter. Um, counter ID, keeping people alive uh, so they can come home to their families. And uh, thank you, thank you. I will step out into the area out here so the next guys can set up. However, if you've got more questions, generic questions about Iraq, stuff about IEDs, stuff about anything like that, I'd be more than happy to answer your questions. Thank you again. Somehow we didn't, I never checked next door and I, it never got started. But luckily, this one's rolling, so hopefully we'll have audio on it. Yeah, so normally what I do, even if they're starting, I'll...